Hello, minders. Welcome back to the Mind of Watercolor. Glad you could join me today. Well, what I want to do is show you and talk to you a little bit about masking and masking strategy because a uh, mask does not always have to be used. And in fact, depending on how loose you paint or what style you paint in, you may never need to use it. I would say as a rule of thumb, at least for me anyway, masking is something that I do when I want to protect intricate areas and intricate edges over a dark background. So I have this little drawing here um, and I want to have the woods or the background behind this tree and this little line of underbrush here. I want to have that very dark. Colorful maybe, but dark. So I'm going to basically mask everything else off. All these little intricate edges, the tree trunks, and these little clouds of foliage here. This is an ideal candidate for masking. And it is a bit tedious. I think that's why some artists don't like to use it. Depending on the level of detail or precision in the work that you're doing, uh, you may just not want to worry about it. In this case, I do. Now, I have done a scenario exactly like this where I didn't mask and I painted all of these elements lightly and then I painted around them for the dark background. I will link to that episode below so you can see a comparison if you want to in the two strategies. But in this strategy, uh, I want a little more control and precision. And so I want to be able to control how that background looks. Most importantly, I want to be able to contiguously work that wash in the background. In other words, I want to be able to do wet and wet and strokes right through, uh, which is something you can't do when you're painting around. You have to kind of almost stay solid and consistent with your color. You have to have a good bit of it mixed up. But if you want all these colors wet and wet, blooming and a lot of variegation, you want to just be able to paint right through all of that. That's why you need mask. It's not just the precision. So there's that strategy. One of the reasons that some watercolors avoid mask is because they produce a hard edge. It's very easy to soften the edges and that's what I want to really focus on and show you today. There are several ways to deal with it and that's what we're going to do. So let's get started and I'm going to mask all this off first. Pebio Drawing Gum is my favorite. Um, there are a lot of decent masks out there but I, I usually return to this. I like the gray color, it just shows up well. And I will use either a soaked brush uh, depending on how fine the detail is or this little silicone applicator. This is the easiest to use. You just peel off the mask when you're done. However, you have to dip it more often. And it's not quite pre as precise as a fine brush. I'm just gonna stir it up here. I'll have a little stirring stick. Mask smells horrible. <laughs> That's probably a reason that a lot of people wouldn't use it. I mean, it's it really it smells like something is dying. But if you don't get your nose right over it, it's not so bad. It's just a latex rubber. Uh, do not shake your mask or you'll get air bubbles in it. Sometimes you'll get solids that will dry. Mask goes bad fairly quickly. I've started storing it upside down because an uh, art store I was in did that. I don't know if it really works. It seems to and extend the shelf life a little bit but you will get little solid parts that will start to uh, form in it. It usually will still work. So I just stir it up gently, really, really well. The second thing I do is I pour it into a little container like this. I want this uh, bottle exposed to the air as little as possible. Just pour myself out an amount there and I recap the bottle and put it and store it back in the drawer. And a lot of these uh, little foliage clumps will have very frilly edges and I'm gonna wanna soften some of them. So I will fill a portion of it and then just sort of dot and dash the edges just to give it a little bit of breakup. Really when you're using an applicator, a silicon applicator, you're floating it on more than you're brushing it. Applying it with pressure like a brush is, it usually doesn't work very well with these applicators. When you start getting mask on the surface of your paper, it will start to dry very, very quickly. And so it's usually not a good idea to go back over and brush an area that started to dry. You wanna be very careful about that because you'll just start to pull it up again. 
as you can see you can get pretty fine with a line and I even have some finer point applicators which I may pull out in a minute you don't need it very thick um, another mistake is um, some artists will just put huge thick globules on there you don't need it very thick it tends to go down thick naturally but the film can actually be pretty thin here's one of the finer point applicators that I have this is really good for getting in those little spots also as you're masking because it does dry so fast you'll get build up on the tip just rub it off with your finger you may need to do that several times during an application it takes a little practice to get the hang of it don't expect it to act like paint if you're trying to fill a big area you can sometimes put down a big globule and then just sort of spread it around like frosting just don't get too much okay so I've got all that masked off I'm working on these little grasses and underbrush here and I've got my very finest one again a really great tip um, is just adding a thick globule one place and then just pulling it into an area where you want detail if you want to do some really intricate masking and you can go back over I said to be careful going back over but you can go back over you just want to make sure that uh, when you go back over an area um, that you have a lot of wet mask on your brush because if it's starting to dry or you press too much you will actually pick up what was there or what is there and as soon as I finish this edge I'm gonna do some fill and you can do that really quickly so you want to just kind of detail your edges this way I also have a video on all the different methods it's kind of an old video, but I think most of the techniques are still pretty valid. All the different methods for applying mask. If you wanted to get really intricate, like with clothes lines or fence lines, you can use like a dip pen or even a ruling pen. I'm going to get my bigger silicone applicator and just get it down there and really kind of fill now to quickly fill in this area which is going to be more or less solid and you can leave a little a few little holes if you want some dark spots to show up down there uh, when you approach this mass that started to dry or is dry just pat with uh, and float it on don't brush it or you'll pull it up that's what I'm talking about I keep my cup really close because with these applicators I'm like a brush with these applicators you have to re-dip a lot so And I will probably not be applying any dark paint down this way. So uh, it'll be mostly from here up. So I just need a edge masked far enough uh, to create a safe zone, basically. I really want the background to have a very spontaneous look, which is why I'm going to all this trouble. And I can't do that if I'm painting around all these little intricate things. And I don't know how far out here I'm going to paint this is just a study really a demo so but I'm gonna maybe bring it out further than I think I need it just to be safe and then it's just letting it dry now I let mask air dry I do not use a hair dryer I can't I, I've never read actually whether that is a problem or not but I think it would be <laughs> so it dries pretty quick so I just go do something else till it's done. Another tip, just to reiterate, and I've mentioned it in other videos, but test, test, test. Don't use mask. I have seen this so many times. Don't use mask on a paper that you don't know for sure whether it's going to tear it or not. Don't wait till you're doing a finished piece. Mask it all off. Then go back and pull it off and you find out, oh no this paper tears with mask I've had just tragic comments from people saying ah it tore my paper tore and I I say over and over and over again 
test, test, test. Use a paper you know won't tear. And you know it won't tear because you've tested it. All right, this is thoroughly dry. By the way, I'm using Kilimanjaro. This is just a sketchbook of their paper. This is a good lifting paper, so it's a good one for doing some of the edge softening that we're going to talk about. Now, on the background here, you're going to see why I went to such trouble to mask all this off. Okay. Matter of fact, I'm going to turn it upside down because I'm on an angle and I want the water to run this way. Here's why I turned it upside down. All right, let's turn it back. Now we can go this way and let those colors sink back the opposite direction. Trying to keep everything clear here because this is really just a safe zone that I didn't want any color down here. I ended up getting a little spatter because I'm going to have this kind of run the opposite way. So we'll see. We'll see how it works. Some of this stuff is always a little bit of a risk. That's all right. That's what makes watercolor fun and interesting. Now I think what I want to do is let that soak in a little bit and do some clear water spatter. All right, so we've got a little dioxazine purple, some Prussian blue, a little bit of olive green, some phthalo green, just a nice little foresty background there. All right, let's see what happens. I'm going to use a trigger sprayer just to get some sprinkles, clear water, trigger sprayer, barely open the nozzle. And you can always try this out on your palette first to see if you're getting... Ah, see that? That's what I'm looking for. That is what I'm looking for. That sort of lizard skin texture. You can even make it crawl out a little bit. <laughs> I love it. That's cool. See how it broke that up a little bit. Let's maybe add a little bit of spatter. I'm going to protect this bottom area. Just dioxazine purple mixed with a little green. All right, I'm pretty happy with that, so I'm going to let that dry. But that's my main purpose in masking. I couldn't have done any of that with painting around. I would have to use a fairly singular solid color and go around. And that's fine. That may be a whole nother approach that you want to do. Again, I will have a link below to a video where I actually did do that. But it's just really fun to get spontaneous sometimes with parts of pieces you're painting. There's a whole reason I do the spontaneous painting and experiment because I know uh, not only does it teach me certain techniques, but I'm going to use it somewhere. I'm going to uh, allow watercolor to employ its mind somewhere in the painting if I can. So you want to plan for those eventualities or possibilities, I guess. All right, it's thoroughly dry. And I want to see what we've got in terms of mask and what I've got to work with. Just using a rubber cement pickup. It's a great way. You can roll it off with your fingers too. I don't like to do that. I like to use these. Paper is reacting really well to the mask. But I knew it would. You can feel where little bits of mask are left. It's really easy to feel it too. And you can see where all of that sort of spontaneous painting just went right through that. I mean, that's impossible. Again, I know I'm repeating myself, but that's impossible to paint around and do those kind of effects. And I also want to employ some spontaneous painting technique down here from as I paint in these grasses and underbrush 
and have you know a little bit sort of some really interesting things happening down here and just kind of fade away into a lost and found wash now one of the main things i wanted to talk to you about and demonstrate is you don't have to live with all of these hard edges you can soften them you can blend all these edges right into your painting and i'm going to show you how all right, I got, I like what this has left me. That's all very workable. So I'm gonna do a good bit of softening and that's important. All right, so let's take a look at these brushes real quick. And uh, again, I have a video on the various methods for lifting, which includes some scrubbing and edge softening. And uh, I will link to that as I mentioned, but uh, I wanna just go over a couple things. Uh, one is uh, you can go degrees when it comes to softening or scrubbing an edge. This is a watercolor brush, a standard watercolor brush here. This is one of the stiffer varieties. This is a Princeton Elite, but uh, you can do a good bit of softening and lifting with uh, just the brushes you paint with every day. Now, if that's not giving you very good results, uh, you can go the next route, which uh, I use a lot of these. These are Hogs bristle brushes, like you use for oil painting or acrylic. It's stiffer, but it does provide some decent uh, lifting scrubbing action. And of course, the top most aggressive tier is this, and this is an actual scrubber. This is made for the purpose of scrubbing paint off surfaces. Now, unfortunately, the name is a bit of a misnomer, and this is something I repeat often, so just get used to me repeating it because it kind of, it's kind of important. When you use a scrubber, you don't actually scrub. You go very, very lightly. These are so stiff, they're like toothbrushes, that they will provide a lot of the action. And you don't want to abrade the paper any more than necessary, so you still use them very, very gently. The scrubbing action comes from the brush itself. You don't bear down, you don't push hard, and you don't scrub vigorously. It's a very, very light brushing, but we'll show you how that's all done. And you can buy all kinds of sizes, of course, of any of these brushes. Just as an example, here's two small ones. This is a scrubber here, probably one of the smallest scrubbers. And this is a oil brush, a little bristle oil brush. They both make decent lifters. This one over here being more aggressive than this one. And there are different shapes. These are both scrubbers. Is sort of an angled scrubber. It kind of gives you a, a nice of edge and a point. This gives you softer edges, so I like that when I want something softer. And the final aspect to this is paper. Uh, cotton paper is pretty much an essential when you're scrubbing. If you do this with cellulose paper, you're gonna end up with a disaster. I've actually already started a little bit. I kind of scrubbed this edge here, and it will pill just slightly. It will rub back some of the paper. If that is good quality cotton paper, uh, you'll still be able to go back over it with a smooth wash. You really couldn't use cellulose pulp paper for something like this anyway, because the mass is just gonna tear the paper right up. All right, let's get started softening. Now what you'll notice is softening is a combination of lifting, but also uh, loosening color and bringing it into the white area. You can do it either way. So if I wanted to soften this edge, I'm gonna get some water on it. So that's gonna be both lifted and softened and maybe even if I want to pull some of that color down and once again I can't tell you how lightly I am doing this I wish they'd call these brushes lifters or something because uh, just the idea that somebody who didn't know any better will go into an art store and buy a scrubber you're gonna take it home and then just start vigorously going yeah you know like they're using a hard eraser you don't use it like an eraser. In fact, I start out just kind of patting it and then rubbing. And don't, again, don't be alarmed if you're peeling up paper. It will happen. You will peel up paper. But that's why it needs to be good cotton paper. It's about the only paper that survives this kind of treatment and then you can go back and paint on it. And you can go around and and soften several spots, pre-soften it with water if you want to, and then go back. I usually just blot it up. And I usually like to do the lost and found edge effect, where I leave some of it hard, make other of the edges just kind of softly disappear. That's the point. 
Now you can see already, if you look at this shape here compared to this, um, when I go back and start painting, and I can define areas, I can even sort of bring these darker background colors in in a negative painting fashion, and I can really shape that into something that I want. All right, I'm nearing the end of this. I'm working now on these weeds and underbrush. But uh, you can see as I back out of that, that looks pretty good there. That's going to give me a nice base to paint on. And it's already looking a little more pine-like. <laughs> so uh, I'm just continuing to go in and soften some areas around this underbrush. And it's just a long process but again it's worth it I think I mean it looks like I just went in with soft almost like oils and painted in that white all right I think I am done with the edge softening I'm really happy with that I've got a nice uh, much more organic edge here and here so let's get to painting sit back and relax and I'll just take you through this one with some music All right, let's take a final look at this now that I'm done, just for the purposes of being instructive. I'm happy with parts of it. I'm unhappy with other parts of it. I think primarily because uh, I started off with uh, clumps that looked more like a deciduous tree and I tried to pull it around to look more like uh, pine tree needles. And I did all that from my head. That just tells me I need to do a little bit more drawing and studying from life. I may even take parts of this page and do some more uh, masking fluid studies for how to integrate that uh, and find a way to simplify it. Um, I mean, and as a rendering, it works okay. This this is, is very detailed. 
this is much fresher. So as a study, I find that constitutes success for me because it pointed out several things, instructed me, and I learned several things in the process. That's always, to me, a successful study. And from now on, that's one reason it's in this, this sketchbook. From now on, whenever I look at this, I will remember that. I love that. That's what's great about studies. Just compositional things that, as a painting, I'm not super happy with. But that's all right. It's more of a study. I mean, this tree looks like it's wearing a tutu. <laughs> I would break those clumps up a little more uh, organically minor things but uh, those are the kind of things i tell myself i talk to myself these are the kind of things i i encourage you to do with studies focus on what you learn focus on what you want to change or what you need to study more you know again i don't do a lot of studies where i use masking fluid i don't do a lot of masking fluid paintings period where i do almost every detail in masking fluid. So that was an important exercise for me and a beneficial one. And I don't do a lot of trees where I mask uh, the leaves or the foliage canopy, especially ones with fine detail like needles. So I want to do more work there. I want to find ways to simplify it, make it fresher and still uh, representational. Again, I say all that for your instruction and how uh, I think you ought to look at studies and how you can use them and define to yourself what you're doing in the process of doing a study. There's just a lot of painting out there that is just mindless repetition, hoping that you'll get better and better and better and you just hope, you know, uh, hope is not a strategy. You got to fuel it with information. That's what these are great for. That's what I loved about doing this, and I hope it was the same for you. And I hope all of those masking tips um, made you a little bolder in wanting to try it or do some things with it. Do it just for the sake of using masking fluid and seeing what you can do with it. Okay? Thanks, everybody. So glad you tuned in and watched this. Hope this was helpful for you. Thank you so much, patrons, for supporting this content. And we will see everybody in the next video. Bye-bye.